There we go. Okay, technical difficulties. Thank you. We are so honored to be here. We just landed in Istanbul yesterday. I'm Kira. I'm Jake. And we're here to talk to you about how to leverage Lean for your startup. And we want to really focus on not only the big picture, but tips and tools that you can take home and put into practice tonight. Um, my background, I have my background, um, I've worked in government, I've started a company in southern Chile doing fashion, I've managed entrepreneurial programs, and now I'm the director of academic and government relations at Launchpad Central. Gives a click. And my background comes from running accelerator programs at the university level, so coaching hundreds and hundreds of startups, doing my own startup, and now helping thousands of entrepreneurs through our Launchpad Central platform do the lean startup. And uh, you guys have heard probably that word before, Lean Startup, you've heard design thinking. We're gonna get really granular into how to use Lean Startup, what, kind of wherever you are in the process of starting your company. A quick word about Launchpad Central. Launchpad Central is a software platform that helps um, innovation teams manage their customer insights. We work with universities, accelerators, government agencies, Fortune 100 companies, Fortune 500 companies, and help them do this. Our founder was Steve Blank, um, one of the founders of the Lean movement. And was the keynote speaker at last year's Startup Istanbul as Go well. Startup Istanbul. Um, so we, we have joined Roots in this way. He developed this program at Stanford and Berkeley in California, and um, one of our big federal agencies in the US, the National Science Foundation, was looking at the work that he was doing, taking his students through 100 interviews over the course of 10 weeks, and they said, we've got it. We think that you have developed the scientific method for entrepreneurship. And what they realized was that the American government was giving our entrepreneurs money for their ideas without teaching them how to implement them. And they said, this is like giving somebody keys to the car without teaching them to drive. So in this way, this is, this is part of the, like, the driving lesson of entrepreneurship. And we wanted to start off with a little bit of a story about a customer that we recently worked with. So about a year ago, we started working with a globally recognized medical, uh, medical center. And they approached us and they said, hey, we, we love Lean. We want to incorporate it in how we commercialize new products and, and new technologies. So we said, that's great. Uh, and the first use case they gave us was a product kind of like sunscreen within the sun care market uh, that for, for like a high priced sun care uh, treatment. And they came to us and they said, look, we have our entire business model mapped out. Uh, we're ready to go. We, we even have uh, interviews lined up with investors when we go to San Francisco. Really, the only question we have is about uh, distribution channels. How do we reach this, uh, this end market? And at the time, they thought that cruise ships were actually going to be their way to reach this kind of high-end, uh, high-priced market. And we said, you know, that all sounds great, but why don't you pump the brakes a little bit? Before you decide exactly kind of what your product is and who you're selling to, it might be a good idea to have at least a couple, a couple conversations with those customers. Make sure that before you pour millions, in this case, of dollars on product development and product launch, uh, why don't you validate the market, talk to people on cruise ships, talk to your end customers, talk to your channels, and at least validate this. So they canceled their, their, their conversations with investors and they kind of hit the streets, they got, got out of the building, if you will, and talked to these customers. Within a really short time, like within a couple weeks, they, what they found was really disheartening to them. What they found was that people were not willing to spend money on this high-end pro high product. Uh, nobody really wanted this thing that they thought was gonna be so awesome. So in about week eight of doing this process, they were starting to look back at their customer interviews and they saw a trend that at least a few people had mentioned, you know, this isn't the best product for me now, but it would have been really great when I had this certain skin ailment. And they thought that was really interesting. So they decided to kind of dive down that path a little bit and talk to people with this skin ailment. And so for the next week, they talked to uh, lots and lots of people within this kind of industry and in this market. And they found a hair on fire pain, something that they were uniquely positioned to solve. So they completely pivoted their market and their product from what was a hundred million dollar market to a hundred billion dollar market. All because they listened to their customers, they understood that th their initial kind of confirmation bias and they didn't necessarily marry their idea right away. So they're now in the process of commercializing this product. 
um, and they're on their way to market. Excellent, thanks. Oh, so um, we've seen a lot of changes in the way that innovation and startups are happening. Previously, there was this notion that if you have a startup, it's just a smaller version of a big company. You need basically all the same things. You need a CEO, a COO, a CFO, and you have this idea, you write a long plan, and uh, then poof, you produce a product and the customers come, and that's the whole story. And what we're finding is that startups are actually a very different animal. They are not a big business. They are a temporary organization that is in search of a scalable, repeatable business model. So you're just figuring out what works. And so we're moving from these five-year financial plans, which you just heard the last investor say, she doesn't care about them because she's never hit them. She's either gone below or above. Um, nobody reads the 30-page business plans. And uh, this idea that if you just build, they will come, we've seen again and again, doesn't really work most of the time. No business plan survives the first, um, the first contact with a customer. And uh, these can be very expensive experiments if you develop a whole plan before you talk to anyone. And so the thing that we recommend is that as soon as you have an idea, you start getting market feedback right away. So we're moving from this idea that you're a big business just executing an idea to in search of a repeatable, scalable business model. Anything to add on this one? Uh, no. Great. And yeah, to summarize this, the rules of innovation are changing. We're going from business mod models, business plans, to business model canvases. We're going to be talking a lot more about this. But it's how to basically look at your entire business on a glance. Jake will be diving deep in. Uh, we're looking at customer development, not just after you've built your product and are ready to go to market, but while you're developing the product so that you're building the thing that people really want. And this idea moving from linear execution to listening, pivoting, iterating, and getting closer and closer to your market needs and the biggest market you can get to, which is the really important thing to do. So as I alluded to earlier, uh, we'll kind of backing up, we want to leave you guys with two really key points about Lean Startup. One of them is this, and we created this fancy graphic for it. It's a, a, kind of a, a ring on your ring finger of, of a light bulb, kind of don't marry your idea, right? We really want to hit that home. Your, your initial idea, 99% of the time, will be drastically different than what ends up working in the marketplace. So starting to detach yourself from the idea, don't marry the idea, marry the process. Marry the process of being an entrepreneur and searching for that scalable and repeatable business model. Kind of marry that, that obsessive uh, kind of uh, culture of finding that business model and, rather than the idea itself. The ideas are going to change. Um, so we want to leave you guys with that and keep kind of really, really iterating that concept. And Kira and I have worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs and time and time again, if it's their first time launching a company, this is the hardest thing for them to grasp. They're very, very excited about their first initial concept and oftentimes closed-minded to kind of changing it around that. And after conversations as, as well with investors, you know, that's a really tricky mindset to get into, right? As, as an investor, as a coach, you want to be coachable, listen, adapt, change, be flexible. One of the best attributes you can have as an entrepreneur is the ability to sit back listen to your customers, and adapt accordingly, build the best product for those customers. And one of the best ways and kind of only ways initially to do that is by getting out of the building, right? This is Steve Blank's mantra. Maybe you guys have heard of it before, um, but the answers are not inside the building. The answers aren't on a whiteboard with you and your team kind of talking about what the problems are and what the, pro what the product should be. They're, they're outside, right? So. It's talking to your customers, talking to your channels, testing your products in front of your customers, uh, getting feedback on your prototypes early on. Again, this, this entire idea of engaging the customer in the beginning rather than launching the product and engaging them with them then after you've spent all this time, maybe your life savings, uh, et cetera, on launching this product. And something we'll get back to time and time again is this process is not just for your first initial product launch. It is highly continuous. 
So as Kira mentioned, we work with Fortune 500 companies that also struggle with this process of how to launch new products, how to launch new features, how to de-risk this, right? The trickiest and most um, uh, kind of common aspect of a startup is the idea that you, your, your goal is to de-risk the company. How can you de-risk it? Uh, is what investors are thinking, it's what you're thinking, uh, and this is one of the best ways. You're testing it before you launch it, essentially de-risking the, the product. Business model canvas. Has anybody seen this before, the business model canvas? Lots of hands, about ha half the audience have seen this. Fantastic, awesome. So the, for the people that haven't seen it, it's your way of graphically depicting how your business creates and delivers value. Right? So in all these different segments, this is, this is your business, right? So this replaces that 30-page business plan. But m most different from the 30-page business plan is a business plan is static. You create it once, maybe you spend two months creating that plan. This is not static. This changes, it adapts, it's flexible. You, you do it once and then every single day you're adapting, you're iterating on it, you're constantly adjusting. And once you do your first product launch, you're working on the next one, the next feature and you're mapping your business on the canvas. The idea is that kind of on day one of you kind of engaging in the process, you fill it out, but you fill it out with guesses, educated guesses and hypotheses for what you think your business model is. And you get very specific about that. Um, and I'll dive deeper into two different aspects of the business model canvas. Value propositions and customer segments. When you're just starting out, or when you're just releasing a new product, these are the, the two most important ones to hit home first. And the reason is they get at this idea of product market fit. And if you don't hit who your customers are and the value that you're providing to them, the rest of the canvas doesn't matter. How you're gonna get money, who you partner with, what your channels are, none of that matters unless you have an awesome product or service that's solving a real pain uh, or adding, adding real value to a very specific customer segment. Uh, starting with customer segments, these are who you are creating value for. So these are your paying customers. Let's say you are a social media platform. Your paying customers might be advertisers, right? So getting specific on who those advertisers are, um, as specific as possible. And then your users are also people that you're delivering value for. Very important that you get extremely granular, at least in the beginning, on who these people are. How old are they? Where do they live? Uh, how much do they make? What magazines do they read? Uh, these are your early adopters. These are the people that are going to tell other people about your business. These are the people that are gonna take a chance on your business when others might not want to. So the, this specific segment exists and you need to start to define that. And as you have conversations with people, maybe your first take at the canvas, you have three different ideas of who those users are, but you're very specific on that. And you want to talk to those three different types of users to figure out who's going to be that power user that's going to push all the other users and drive your platform. The next segment, value propositions. So this is the specific value that you are providing to those users. You're going to have different value for your customers, your paying customers, versus your users if you are a social media site, right? If you have a multi-segmented market, that's the case. Uh, but you're going to, again, you're going to have to provide very specific value. The biggest uh, pain or the biggest issue that we've seen with entrepreneurs when we coach them is this idea of features uh, versus value propositions. So oftentimes entrepreneurs will put in features instead of the actual value. That's a, that's a shift, a mindset shift you have to make. So you're talking about the product rather than the, the, the value that you're providing. So an example of this is if you take Tesla cars and you talk about, all right, so Maybe the feature of a Tesla car is the idea of plugging in my car at night to charge its battery. But the benefit, the value that I'm providing is saving the environment and, not, and sa saving money on, uh, on gas, right? That's the, that's the value that I, I'm adding to it. I happen to be solving that problem by making an electric car that can plug into a, a wall at home. Eventually, they can solve that same problem by maybe hovering over a surface um, in the garage that does the exact same value, right? We're detaching ourselves from the features and just talking about the pain points. Customer development, this is the process for testing your hypotheses through customer interactions. And you can have lots of different types of interactions and we'll talk about that in a little bit. 
And when you start to engage in this process, after you've mapped out your business model, um, it's time to start designing your customer development experiments. And these are, this is a really kind of simple step-by-step -step way in doing this. Uh, first, identify which hypotheses you're going to be testing. Uh, you're not, you can't physically test every single one at once, so we want you to focus on which are the most important at any given time in your business model. Which are those assumptions that, if you are wrong about, are going to kill your business? You can't be wrong about these. Again, if you're just starting out, these are your value propositions and your customer segments. Uh, how will you test them? Will you go out and do customer interviews? Will you take a prototype out and, and watch customers use this? Do you have an MVP that you can test? Are you doing A-B testing with your, with your website? Again, we're going to get even more detailed as this presentation goes on. What will you measure? Uh, how will you determine success or failure? So again, we are, if, if I haven't said it already, which I don't think I have, really this is the scientific method for entrepreneurship. You have a hypothesis, you design an experiment, create your metrics for success, learn from those, and do it again. Right? This, it's nothing new, it's the scientific method. It's been proven in our societies for thousands of, I don't know when the scientific method was created, but a long time. Right? And so that's the idea, is you, need, you need to figure out your, how you're gonna measure success. Is it 30 customers that sign up on your email list? Is it however many people click this certain thing on your prototype? Whatever it is, it needs to be measurable. You need to determine that in advance. And then rinse and repeat. So once you've, once you've done that experiment and you've, you've learned a lot, maybe you've discovered something else in that market, you incorporate it in your next experiment and do it all over again. Okay, so now we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into customer interviews. And when we thought about this presentation, we wanted to make sure that you came away with three things. First, don't marry your ideas, marry the process, get out of the building, and then this is the skill that we wanted you to learn, which is customer interviews. Now you might ask, why customer interviews? If you're running a startup, you have a list of, I don't know, hundreds of things to do, you're never sleeping, there's a bunch of mission critical things to do. Why do this? This is where you're going to get the most information rich in, uh, information from your customers. Interacting with people in person, you can see what their body language is telling you. If their eyes, if their, if their pupils are dilating, if they seem excited, the change of the intonation of their voice, if they seem harried and they want to do something else. Um, you can be nimble and probe and get to exactly what their, their pain point is. So here are five best practices of conducting a customer interview. One, you want to identify your goals and important assumptions to test in advance. So these are really what Jake was talking about. Like, what are your company killing assumptions? So if you aren't able to get this price from a vendor, then you're not making a profit, and that's a company killing assumption. Who do you think your customers are? Uh, if those aren't your customers, you need to know about them that now. What do they really value? And so these, these are the kinds of things that you want to be testing then you want to make sure that you're asking who, what, where, when, why questions. You want to ask questions that lead people to talk more. If you're asking a question that results in a yes or a no, you're getting a very small amount of information um, that, you, that you could be getting. Expanding upon what Kira is saying, when, when someone answers a question of yours, um, dive deeper into that, into that answer, right? Don't accept the answer as is. Get deeper, get extremely granular. Why do you do this? Um, and then why, ask why again. And ask, ask when you do this. Oftentimes the answers aren't in the first question that you're asking. It's in the whys and the context behind those, those answers that you have to get deeper and deeper into. So get them talking. And, and oftentimes the best way to do that is to continue to ask these whys. Thank you. Um, this is a really big one. Get really excited to hear things that you don't want to hear. As entrepreneurs, we often listen for, oh, that sounds exciting, or I'd love to hear more, or sure, why don't you bring this back when you have a prototype? And that may not mean that these are actually your customers. These, that may not mean that people actually want to make an investment. And so what you want to dive in, in here is the things that you don't want to hear, their concerns, their questions, uh, the things that they think that might be a little bit off. Those are the things that you're listening for, and those are your areas for growth. 
When you ask people about um, a particular problem area, they often don't know how they feel. Um, but they do know how they act. And so if you dive deeper into people's behavior patterns, if we're going on the social media, how do you feel about Facebook? Well, I don't know how I feel about Facebook. Well, when do you use Facebook? How, how many times a day do you use it? How long are you on for? What kind of activities are you doing? How many people are you connected to? Um, what kinds of interactions do you have? Are you meeting new people? Are you just staying connected with people from the past? These questions I can answer, and you can probably answer too. How I feel about it is an entirely separate conversation that I, I don't really have access to. And the last one is really hard for entrepreneurs, but also really important. This is not a time for you to pitch. This is not a time for you to sell. This is not a time for you to get people to take something home. This is a time for you to learn. Um, and we have to be very careful of our confirmation biases, that we, that we can listen to all of this information and even the information that we don't want to hear. We have a short video for you on uh, confirmation biases. <laughs> I, want I want to ask, ask you a question. question. Straight, Straight out. out. Flat, Flat out. out. I want you to give me an honest answer. answer. What do you, what do you think, think the chances, chances are of a guy, guy like you and a girl like me? me. And they end up together. together. Well, well, it's, it's difficult, difficult to say. say. You, you really don't... don't hit me with it. Just, just give, give it to me straight. straight. I came a long, long way, way just to see you marry. Just, just at least, least you can lose level with me. What are, what are my chances? chances? No, not good. You mean not, not good, good, good like, like one out of a hundred? I'd, I'd say, say more like one, one out of a million. million. So, so you're telling, telling me there's, there's a chance. chance. <laughs> yeah! Sorry about the delay on that. That's a little bit funny. But it, it is that, that thing that we often see with entrepreneurs that they'll say, an investor will say, like, sure, yeah, come back and tell me when you have an update on this. And they hear, OK, so you're going to write a check and, and fund my seed round. That's not what they're saying. But they are saying that they want to learn more, and then you should ask them what the things that they want to see when you next come back. What what are the areas for growth? Who do they want to hear from? Mm -hmm. um, so if you if you decide to engage in this process, which obviously we very much recommend, um, let's say you talk to a hundred people and you're you're in a conversation with the venture capitalist, you say we talked to a hundred people, they all liked our idea. They're going to say BS, right? Um, there, there's going to be something about your idea that doesn't work. What, what, what you want to know is we learned this from those 100 people, and this is how we adapted our business model. We, we're listening to our customers. We're not just out there selling our idea. You can decide today that you want to talk to 100 customers, but if you haven't flipped this mental mindset from my idea rocks to I want to discover and learn more about the market, then this, this process will not work. And that's exactly what I was asking about today in our mentoring sessions. I was learning from startups, and they were telling me what, about what they did. And I said, I don't really care. They, they wanted to hear what we thought and what they should do. And I was like, I actually want to hear what your customers think and what your customers think you should do and what kind of pain points they're having and what makes them really excited to use your product over something else. Um, and that's where the meat of our conversations were. So. Um, here is the flow of how you do a customer interview, uh, basically every time. So number one, you set the context for the, inf you set the, context for the conversation. Um, thank you so much for being here. We're just going to chat for 10 or 15 minutes. Hint, you often ask for less time than you really need. And once you get them talking, um, they'll often want to talk for more. So, we're going to talk for this amount of time. I'm going to be asking you about the ways that you use social media today. I want to learn a little bit more about your practices and what you use and what you like and what you don't like. They understand exactly what's happening. Then you want to go into their demographic information. So this is the information where you're learning exactly what Jake was saying, how old they are, their gender, how much they make, what magazines they read, what car they drive. You want to be able to create a customer archetype. And as you create that customer archetype, that's one of your customer segments. So you want to be able to cluster information about 
this particular demographic. A expanding on that, on that point for one second, uh, also in the mentoring sessions earlier, we, we heard a, a common theme from a few of the startups, and the idea was we're building, essentially what they're saying is we're building a startup for everyone. Right? And that is, that is never the case, especially early on. So that's why getting extremely specific this early on is of the utmost importance uh, when, you're, when you're creating your business model, but also figuring out once you've identified who those customers are and who you're speaking with and who suffers from the pain the most, that, you're going to be able to, to target them very specifically. Right? You're going to know exactly what magazines to target them in, where to find them online. You don't have a billion dollar marketing budget, so you have to be very strategic with how you spend that. And if you have a specific uh, market segment, demographic information about a customer segment, you can be specific about where you spend your marketing and time to advertise online. And also really importantly, where not to. If you think that uh, your whole demographic is you know, young moms who shop at a particular grocery store and do their exercise classes in a particular place, and it turns out they don't care about your product at all, it's really valuable to know that earlier on so you're not wasting all your market, marketing dollars trying to get to those people. Uh, so then you want to learn about their behaviors. This is the behaviors versus feelings thing. So learn about how they're currently solving the problem that you're trying to solve. So there's a rule of thumb. Um, if your product is 10% better than what's out there, you're probably not going to get any traction. Guess how many times better your product needs to be in order to be adopted than its competitors? Any guesses? Does it need to be one time? 10 times better. 10x better? So yeah, I've heard between 3 and 10x better. So you're looking at substantial, not incremental margins. And that's really important because it's easy to, be, to have a couple features that are marginally better than what's out there. But to have something that's 3x better or 10x better, that's really hard. Um, so learning about what kind of pain points they have in the current way that they're solving the problem, um, would they be willing to pay to do things differently? There's a lot of things that people want, but they wouldn't necessarily pay for. We've developed a lot of very entrenched consumers that feel like they're entitled to get whatever they want, basically at a free price. Um, so understanding where you can capture value from them is really important. Um, have they tried different ways of solving this problem? If it's such a pain point that they've been an innovator themselves and are trying to hack it, then that's a market that you should be looking at. Um, and what aspects of this problem are important to them? So what really matters if there's, if there's one or two features or one or two um, values that really matter about that? What are they? This is, the, this is the bulk of the conversation, right? This is where you get to do all of that discovery. You get to learn about their, how they're currently solving the problem that you're considering solving, the nuances of, about it. Maybe there's a section of, of, the, of the current behavior that nobody's really paid attention to before, but because you ask them why they do certain things, you were able to take that out, right? So this is, this is where all of this discovery really takes place. So yeah, this is like 90% of your conversation. Now, the last 10%, you can do two things. After you've learned everything that they have to share with you, then you can start working with your MVP or your prototype and asking them specific questions about it. Do they like the particular sign-up flow? Do they think that they would use it? What times did they think they would use it? How much would they pay for it? But this is a very small portion of the conversation. And then the last part is the viral part. So if you're really serious about doing customer interviews, you may talk to over 100 people in a number of months, and it's hard to reach that many people um, quickly. And your first tier of your network dries up within a week or so. So always ask for introductions. Tell them how grateful you are for their time and that you'd love to talk to them again, and is there anyone else that's like them that they could talk to? Um, another rule that we have is um, telling them that they're the smartest person in the industry. So if you're talking to somebody who isn't just a consumer, but maybe a key opinion leader, saying, hey, I've heard that you're the smartest person in the social networking industry. I have a few ideas. I'd love to share them with you, and I'd love to learn from you. And letting people know that you really value their time and value their opinion often gets you a foot in the door. So this isn't the be all and end all of um, getting customer feedback. There are other ways to do it. We just recommend that early on, uh, while you're 
in the early phases, you uh, get the most information rich data. Um, but of course, you can use prototypes and wireframes, Google AdWords to see your click through rates, landing pages to see how many emails you get. Um, you can interact with online communities like blogs, like Quora, like Reddit, um, and surveys, which are great, but should be used in a very specific capacity. Yeah, the, the same methodology holds true with all of these different ways of gathering feedback. It's all customer development, right? So you define your hypotheses, you build the experiment that you're gonna test these hypotheses, you engage it, you measure, and then you learn and repeat, right? So whether you're doing, whether you're showing a prototype to someone, you're showing it to them testing a very specific feature or a very specific value proposition of your product to gain feedback on, again, to measure the results and then repeat the experiment. Great. Okay, so now it's your turn. We are going to ask you the thing, to do the thing that no other speaker asks you to do, which is take out your phone, open up some notes, and we're gonna do an exercise from here to there. So our first question, phone's out. Uh, our first question are what are your company killing exceptions? What do you have to get right in order to make your company successful. Um, we're gonna give you a minute to write some answers down. And the things that you wanna be focusing on are like, what are the features that are really critical? What is the pain point that you need to solve? Um, is it a channel partner? Is it a, is it a price that you need to secure in order to be price competitive? What are your company killing assumptions? Yeah, if your entire business model is kind of uh, posed on one value proposition or one, one di differentiating aspect of your business, you better be darn sure that the customers also feel that pain enough, three times as much, uh, in order to kind of validate the idea in the business model. So what are those key things? It could be any aspect of the business model cannabis. Give you guys 10 more seconds or so. Okay, next one. Who do you need to talk to to test these assumptions? So this could be a potential customer segment, this could be a manufacturer, this could be a distribution channel, this could be a key opinion leader that you need their opinion in order to penetrate a certain market. Who are these people that you need to talk to? This is your time to get extremely specific like we've been mentioning throughout the presentation. How old are they? Um, what are their habits and routines? Where do they live? Are they a, in an urban city? Right? Get, get very specific. Is it a local market? How will you gather this information and how will you quantify success? So um, we've had entrepreneurs go everywhere to get customer interviews. We've seen them in the waiting rooms at hospitals, in malls, um, in the playground, talking to parents, uh, in manufacturing facilities, at protests, on college campuses. Um, we've seen them go to particular places during holidays where they know that they can talk to a particular demographic that celebrates that holiday. Where do you need to go to talk to these people? And then the follow-up question is, how many of these people do you need to talk to? And what percentage of them needs to give you a positive answer in order for this to be what we consider a go decision? You can have a go decision or a no-go decision. And defining these terms ahead of time, knowing what success means, will set you up for a much better outcome. We find 
that the vast majority of entrepreneurship is in this gray zone of it's kind of working and it's kind of not working and it's kind of working and it's kind of not working. And so setting your metrics for success ahead of time will let you be more disciplined about making a call, whether it's time to form a company and really take something to market or if it's time to shut down the company and work on something else. Would anybody like to share their responses? Of how you're gonna reach customers? Great. Why don't you kind of stand up, introduce yourself, and then we can go through the four questions, and you can talk about that. So you want to step back to the number one? Yeah, he, he, he have a mic. Perfect. Okay, so um, I'm the co-founder of Campus Suite. Uh, we're working on a social network for campuses. So how it's different is that everything you post on the social network remains completely anonymous. So the first question. Uh, go back. So the assumptions are that people do want anonymity because they can't really openly express their opinions because people might judge them or it might be considered slightly taboo. And uh, another assumption is that campuses do need a network because so in my, at my university, people don't really know what's happening on campus. So they need like a social network where they can communicate with each other. Uh, and last one, last is, is it, are, that, are those all your assumptions? Yeah, uh, pretty much. So the next question is that, uh, what was the next question? Yeah, who do you need to talk to to test these assumptions? Okay, so uh, we talked to uh, other students from my campus, from other campuses, and we also appointed campus ambassadors who would talk to these people. Do you need to talk to campus administrators? Are there other people on campus that set the culture or the tone? Uh, not really, Ma mainly their students were really popular. So they like set the tone of the campus usually. <laughs> so it's, so it's the popular need, kids that are yeah. leading the way for you guys. So Got that's the people we did talk to. Okay, great. How will you gather this information? So are you, are you just gonna go to campus to talk to them or do you go to parties, do you? So initially uh, we did go to ca uh, the campus and we did talk to them, but uh, then we did like a very small MVP, a very basic app and actually gave it to the users and saw their responses. Okay. So, and, and how did you quantify that success? So when you say, I saw their responses, how did you quantify that? So we had like the session time. Uh, the average session time was 5.4 minutes, which is a lot for an app. And then we also uh, talked to our campus ambassadors. Our campus ambassador talked to the students. So that's how we quantified it. And what kinds of questions are, do you need to ask your campus ambassadors? So uh, what some of the responses we got were slightly mixed, but since we had Google Analytics, we could actually see what people were clicking on and things that they did like, things that they did not like. So one in, for, for instance, uh, we had like topics, so people would keep on posting on those topics and they were kind of like chatting with each other. Nobody said they initially said that they wanted to chat anonymously, but we figured it out and then we introduced like a chat feature and it worked brilliantly. So we were depending more on actual Google Analytics than word of mouth. Got it. Interesting. Yeah. That's great. great. That's Thank you for sharing the story. At this point in time, uh, everybody, we kind of uh, skipped this slide, but the idea is what, what are those questions that you're going to ask to solve that problem? Um, and a lot of these are, are the how, describe a time in which this happened, right? Or describe the process of doing X. What are the biggest pain points with this? What did you like and dislike about our product or our prototype? Right? Yeah. Those are the main questions. Or if you're using, if, the, if it's a new social networking, like if you're reaching out to your friends, do you use text message? Do you use WhatsApp? Do you, do you use Facebook Messenger? Um, why do you use these different things? When do you use multiple? Um, how does that get confusing? What features are you missing? Exactly, and to, to go to your example again, um, so you're, you're already testing the product, which is, you know, that's awesome that you have a product to test. Before you even get the product in the hands of the individuals and the users, I'd be obsessed with understanding how they use social media and where they think it's lacking, right? What is the specific area that you're solving for? Right, if it's if it's we if it's anonymity, right? We were speaking earlier about the uh, anonymous aspect of your application. Uh, I would want to tease that out of of their answers, right? Without leading them, figure out if that's actually a thing that they're going to want, right? 
Okay, another 20 seconds for this one. Uh, hello, I'm Levent. Hi. <laughs> I'm Levent from Ivera, Digital Music Distribution. And can I see the questions again first? Oh, so what kind of questions will you use to talk to your customers? Um, well, we're doing digital music distribution. We have a solution for content owners, music, digital uh, music content owners to so distribute their music via all relevant outlets like Spotify, Deezer, iTunes, and so on. So therefore, they can use our software to make their music available on all the major outlets. So this so is for artists to make their music available. Yeah, yes. that's for independent music producers, which is about 20 million around wor worldwide, mm -hmm. which hardly have access to the major music outlets around the world. So with our software, they can now make their music available on those outlets. And when they, people stream their music or download their music, then the money goes to our software, they can see how much money they made on each outlet, and then they can trigger the payout. So the questions we would ask is, um, how do you distribute your music right now? How do you make it available on those outlets? And most the, the answer would be like, uh, not at all at this moment. And are you willing to pay? And how much are you willing to pay for yeah. that? There, there are lots of questions that you can ask as well uh, in that process. What is the current, how, how do they currently solve this? What yeah. do they care most about, right? During this process, is it trust? Is it just making money? Um, is it the convenience? Is it speed? You know, there are lots of different value yeah. propositions and that you Why do you want home. your music out there at all? Do you want to make money or do you want to just promote it? Yeah, things exactly. Like what, yeah. And, and those are the things that you will highlight on your website, in your marketing materials, in the product itself. But without speaking to them first and truly understanding the process and the pain points, it's really difficult to just guess at it. And you'll have to continue to guess at it until you get it right. Right. Sounds like a very interesting product, though. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so before we dive into this, you might be asking yourself, wow, this sounds like a lot of work. I have a lot of things to do. Why am I going to talk to people? I have a company to build. I have to raise money. Um, why should I be talking to them about their problems? And we just wanted to share one more, well, actually two more, but another success story using this methodology um, from UCSF, which is a leading medical school in California, um, from our chief of surgery, who developed a new therapeutic um, to cure hernias. And he was so clear that because he'd been doing this for 20 years, um, he developed the therapeutic, he knew the doctors, he knew what they wanted, that the only thing to do was basically like sign, seal, deliver, just distribute it. And he found that talking to customers um, allowed him to see that what he thought that they valued was different than what they actually valued um, and may have found a much different and bigger market. Let, let's learn more. So uh, we're, we're in Vitruvian Medical Devices. And our product is uh, something to treat hernias before they happen from people who have surgeries. We've had 14 interviews. We uh, changed our canvas a little bit. Um, we are talking mostly with surgeons. So of the 14 uh, interviews that we did, over two thirds were, were with actual surgeons. Um, when we said that we had a product that might you know, cost a thousand dollars that would prevent a hernia. They said they would pay actually twenty thousand dollars if we had a product that could prevent a bile So Hobart's pupils dilated at that point. <laughs> so not 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 the surgeons, but his pupils dilated. If we could prevent the bile for that surgeon, they would pay a lot more money for that. But for the the product that we're proposing, they even thought a thousand dollars might be too high for that. And that 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 would be too high of a price to pay for that. So these are things that we learned. Awesome. So did you feel like this was a worthwhile week? Did you learn something? Oh, it, it, it saved us probably several years worth of... No, seriously. Of, no, seriously. Because our, our thought is that surgeons would embrace this, right? And so what we didn't realize is that they're not embracing it because they don't think it's a, a problem that they have. And what was the last ratio you used before I interrupt? This would save you several what? Years.
can't wait for the next nine weeks. <laughs> So the whole point is that you might be thinking that you need to drive quickly towards your market um, as quickly as possible, but actually stopping and talking to people might save you years of your time and in your investors' money um, going in the wrong direction. And so you want to have the market sanity check and make sure that you're, you're doing it right. This is just a really simple graphical representation of kind of what we've been talking about. Um, in rapid experimentation. So again, the idea is hypothesize about what your business model is, design experiments around that, uh, test them, and of course, learn, iterate, and do it again. So th this is also a fun little graphic that we put together. Um, we, we do these kind of 10-week sprints oftentimes with startups, and maybe when you're in, involved in an accelerator or an entrepreneurship course, you might be doing something similar where on day one you map your assumptions, and again, you get into this, I, my idea rocks, right? My idea is gonna be killer, it's gonna be the next Facebook. And then once you get out of the building and start talking with customers, oftentimes you don't hear what you necessarily wanna hear, right? So you kind of get down in the dumps and you say, well, maybe not, right? And over the course of continuing to talk with customers, changing your hypotheses, pivoting a little bit, adapting, you end up developing the product that's perfect for the market, the product that, the, the product that perfectly solves the solution and the pain point that, uh, that your customers need. So that's the found it, let's go, let's run with it. And then of course, until the next feature launch, the next product launch. Um, lean never stops, right? So this, again, is applied to companies, startups, you know, it's originally called the Lean Startup and has been brought into companies of all sizes, right? So again, as Kira mentioned, we work with Fortune 500 companies all the way down to startups and everything in between. So the companies listed here, uh, namely Intuit and Airbnb, they run hundreds, sometimes thousands of experiments going every single day. So they have Lean in their DNA and so what we're preaching really is to start thinking about how this applies to you now and continue to kind of hone in on this skill and develop it as a necessary component of the development of your startup, right? As you continue to build, you get obsessed with this process and then continue to figure out ways to ingrain it uh, as you develop new features, new product lines, et cetera. We're gonna end with just a couple more examples because we really think that examples hit home. You might pick one out more than the other. Uh, this was a company called Wiser, and they went through one of Steve Blank's kind of main entrepreneurship courses slash accelerators. Uh, the initial concept was a wearable that for physicians and doctors and hospitals that provided hand sanitization, uh, which pr would prevent uh, and reduce the risk of healthcare associated infections. And by the way, it also uh, gave data to the hospitals. So they were gonna compete very much in this wearable space. In fact, they had already started developing prototypes around this idea. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. What they found out very quickly was that the, the main value was not actually in the wearable itself, but was in the data that they were gathering. So after they talked to lots of physicians, doctors, uh, healthcare, people in hospitals, right, and administrators and people that were doing uh, a lot of these testings, they, they found that the data was actually the real key. So how could they collect better data? Uh, hospitals were saying, if you can collect this data for me, it'll save me tens of thousands of dollars, right? They didn't really care about the hand sanitization. Apparently every room has hand sanitization equipment in it. Really it was monitoring whether the physicians were going to use it or not. So. They iterated, they adapted, they changed their MVP. So they went from this initial MVP of this wearable into this whole data gathering system using existing technology. Every physician apparently has a badge that can be monitored. There's uh, motion sensing equipment in every room and there happens to be a hand sanitization unit. So their core was how you can connect the, those three things and develop a platform that's easy to use that, uh, that the hospital, hospital administrators can easily gather the data and visualize the data so that they can use this to save lots of money on compliance. So this was a huge industry, a huge problem that they had kind of no idea that they were grazing until they talked to uh, the physicians in the market. So again, monstrous pivot. And this is a picture of the prototype and the wireframe that they were showing 
hospitals in the San Francisco area, and they secured their first customer from this picture, right? So it took them, I think this was week 10 when they were started bringing this around, and it was so meaningful. They had, the, the physician had, or the, the hospital administrator had such a pupil dilating moment, is what we call it, that they were ready to sign right then and there. So they're currently building out the platform and they'll test with this hospital very shortly. And lastly, I think, the, oh, sorry, just one last exa example. I know we have lots of stories, lots of examples. I hope that they're kind of hitting home with you. Just one last one for you. And take it away. I'm Emily Redden. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Blue River Technology. I'm a roboticist, and my expertise is in computer vision and machine learning. I'm Jorge Herod. I'm the uh, co-founder and the CEO. My background is in engineering and computer and precision agriculture really well. We started out uh, the Lean Launchpad class with designing an autonomous lawnmower. And we went out and we talked to all these different customer segments. And they didn't want an autonomous lawnmower. Really excited from the engineering side, not really a viable market there. We started talking to uh, some of the guys on the ag side. They had big busloads of people coming in and pulling weeds, and that's what they needed. They didn't need somebody to drive around their tractor. They, they had people to do those operations. They needed people to go out, and they needed the weeds to be removed. Steve Lang had been talking about a minimum viable product. This concept of MVP applied really well to, to software companies, but we were wondering, gee, can we use uh, the, same, the same idea uh, to hard work? And so that was what we did. It was, uh, it was kind of this incredible, you know, it's time to build moment. You just sleep in lab, you build the whole robot the whole week, then you go and you take it out, and you test it with the customer. But that was actually a crucial point in getting the next stage in credibility with the customer. Even though it wasn't perfect, there were a bunch of parts of it that didn't quite work, but getting it out there, getting it in their hands, having them give us the first pass at looking at it, really taught us which parts of it we need to go back and redesign, and which parts they're just stunned and blown away by. Our original canvas had us selling the equipment through a value-added reseller. But what we got from talking to the customers was that they were paying a service currently and that we would come in and we would be almost a direct replacement in that instead of buying a piece of equipment, they would hire us as a service to go out and do the operation. And we met a customer that we really liked and they'd given us a lot of feedback uh, they were very willing and actually tried to build lettuce thinners at several points in their history. So this was, this was kind of like a light coming on in that if they're willing to go out and try to build these machines, they really have a pain point. We found that lettuce thinning was a perfect opportunity and so uh, we pivoted away from weeding and carrots to then building a lettuce thinner. We were able to raise money from angel investors, get a grant from the NSF and SBIR grant. We were able to show a prototype to our first potential customer, the largest lettuce grower in the U.S., and get them excited. And with that excitement, we were able to bring some of the VCs to even see that machine in the field, talk with the customer, and eventually get our Series A funding from Coastal Ventures, which is a prime VC, especially in the area of agriculture. The value of using Launchpad Central is it helps organize your team into using the different tools. So that way, three weeks later, and you've done all these different customer interviews, they're not tagged all through different emails that you can actually track and see which pivots you've made, why you've made those, and be very cognizant of the process that you're going through. And without going out and talking to customers, we wouldn't have gotten their insights. And so the customers have way more insights than we had, and that we could have come up with different sets of machines, uh, but they had been thinking about their own problems for so long. If you just go out and you try to sell, maybe you'll find some buyers, maybe you won't, but you really won't be learning about what you should be doing.
Yeah, so that video really hits home a number of points. I mean, first and foremost, they pivoted four times, right, throughout their development. They pivoted their, value, their main value proposition, uh, their, their customer segment, their revenue model. Uh, maybe there wasn't a fourth. There, there, was, there was one more in there. But again, they weren't married to their initial concept. They wanted to learn about the market, test their, test their prototype, bring it out in the field before they went into mass manufacturing. Because of this process, they were able to build something specific and build a business model around it that was specific for their industry and raise, raise lots of funds around that. I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here. Um, this is our first time in Istanbul. This is our first time at Startup Istanbul. We've just sat through the first couple rounds of mentoring, and you guys are incredible. Some of the best entrepreneurs in the world that I've seen, that we've seen. Absolutely. And um, yeah, thanks so much for taking the time. You can reach us on LinkedIn or my Twitter's right there. We're happy to answer questions. We'll be around until yeah. the 10th. So uh, thanks again, and have a wonderful first night of Startup Istanbul. Thank you. Thanks, guys.